three disciples to the mountainside to pray. His countenance was modified, his clothing was aflame. Grace and peace to you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior, and our friend. Amen. I, can, I guess I can tell you all now. After all, he's risen from the dead, and the Spirit has sent us out to proclaim the message from Jerusalem to Rome to the ends of the earth. I'm not uh, quite sure where to start, though. At his baptism, maybe? After all, my story today echoes the baptism by John. Or maybe that's, that's probably where this really starts. John. John was killed by Herod, so he went off to a quiet place to rest and to mourn that great man's death. But people showed up. We tried to escape and reflect, but everyone was drawn to Jesus. And we needed to feed them. Sure, Jesus multiplied the loaves and the fishes, but we disciples had to distribute that food. Imagine it. Bachelors and fishermen, tax collectors, 12 men feeding thousands of people. It was hardly in our skill set. It was exhausting to provide for all those people. Then Jesus tried to escape off to a quiet place to pray. And by the end of that, I walked on water. The first I nearly sunk. A scary, exhilarating, exhausting experience. Then we found, fed yet another crowd. Then I confessed who he was, who he is that Jesus is Messiah and Son of God. I felt like I was finally on solid ground with that one. And after walking on water, which I believe you me was not, not solid ground. But then, in response to my confession, he talked about suffering and about death. He kept talking, he kept talking about suffering and death. He wouldn't quit. And then, then he talked about following him and taking up a cross. A God forsaken cross. The cost of following Jesus, the constant threat of death, affliction and doubt. Feeding people constantly. The low level wear and tear of it all. The constant grind it was just too much. But then, after six days, he took the three of us up to Moses. Up rather the mountain, like Moses and Elijah. Moses receiving the commandments and Elijah instructing, instructed by God to find the people of Israel who remained faithful. Jesus was changed before me, before us, becoming radiant and bright like an angel, like a son of God. And then those, those holy men of old were there with us, Elijah and Moses, the law and the prophets, both there with Jesus in the flesh. And all that, you know, all that, fear, that sorrow, and that worry, that hurt, all those things that came with following Jesus, well, they evaporated right there. And remember what I said next. Let's stay here, I'll build booths. I know, it sounds stupid, or naive, or silly. Looks really strange written down there in, in our holy books now. 
my weakness recorded forever, preach in churches by, by, by pastors to this day, but that moment, on that moment on that mountain, I felt safe. It was a solid rock, something that wasn't demanding of me, taking from me. It was something other than suffering, death, and service. That, that's why I wanted to build those boots. But all that, all that was overshadowed by what came next. The voice, the bent coal, the voice of God. Just like at Jesus' baptism. That voice said, this is my son, the beloved, with him I am well pleased. Listen to him. My confession, that Jesus is the Messiah and the Son of God, was confirmed by a voice from heaven. Confirmed just as it was at Jesus' baptism. But more than that, more than that there was a command to listen to him. Listen to suffering and death. And that one that for a variety of reasons we missed. We missed hearing. Listen to him. Listen to resurrection. And in that sublime moment of rest and confirmation there, that there's also a calling. A calling to what comes next. It literally bowled me over, knocked me down into a little whimpering ball by that holy terror of what that calling was and who that Son of God is. It might sound odd, but Jesus telling us about suffering and death is one thing. But the blinding divine confirmation of that calling is a whole different thing. It's so frightening. It still is so, so very frightening. And to my fright, to my fright came a gentle touch in the words, Get up and be not afraid. Those words, Be not afraid. They're words of angels and prophets and the very word of God. Words God spoke to Moses when the Egyptians breathed down his neck. Words spoken to Elijah when confronting the king. Words spoken by Ezekiel and Isaiah and Jeremiah and Joel. Words to me and words to all of you from our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus, they are now alone. No ancient prophets and no, no sparkling visage of a Messiah. But Jesus, Jesus leading us down the mountain, back to the hard work of service, down the mountain to Jerusalem, Jerusalem with its suffering and with its death, down the mountain in silence, telling no one, of this experience. Jesus revealed to us fully in glory, in completion, revealed, revealed to us as our comfort and as God's beloved Son. Revealed to us in commands about following Him even to the most disastrous of end. And following Him even then. Following then, following him even then. So that we we can tell of the resurrection, tell of him being raised from the dead, tell of how suffering and how death, service and discipleship, how they're all matched with being a child of God, comforted by Christ, the valley, and the mountain, 
They're both there. As we head down the mountain into the valley, the darkness, the darkness of all of that, even then, we have seen the light, and it changes the journey to Jerusalem with Jesus. Amen and hallelujah. Have you heard the one about the duck? There's the duck. St. Peter stepped out of the boat, he forgot his raincoat, slip and sank into a wave, now St. <laughs> Jesus says he fucking it. And then with the divine, well he's full of bread and wine, having himself a hell of a time out on the sea.